We are here to talk about the future of consumer VR. I'm Devendra Hardwar, senior editor in Gadget, and today I'm joined by some great people who know a lot about VR. Dan O'Brien, uh, GM at HTC Vive. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Samantha Gorman, uh, co-founder of the Tender Claws. So, hi. Hello. And it's like an art collective for VR. Uh, yeah. It's a, we're an artist and a development studio. Excellent. And Matt Pat. Hey, glad hi. to be here. Hi, Matt Pat. My pleasure. We're here to talk about game theory. Uh, are we? I'm totally ready for I, it. I, I, I thought we were here to talk about VR. I talked about game theory enough. Let's, Let's get ready for some game theory. <laughs> um, but yeah, so last year I think was a great year for virtual reality. We saw all of the consumer platforms launch. We saw Vive, Oculus, PlayStation VR. And now I think a lot of people are asking, what's next? Where are we going? Uh, personally, from my side of the reporting, I've noticed our readers aren't as interested in it as much. I'm still super interested in it. What are you guys thinking? Uh, you know, what are the next steps for VR, you think? Uh, from, yeah, from our side, you know, uh, 2016 was a great kickoff year. Uh, this year, it's really about ecosystem growth, bringing in more partners. You know, we introduced things like the tracker to bring in new peripherals, accessories, um, software solutions. Um, 17 is really about growing the ecosystem, getting deeper, rich, uh, longer experiences and you know we're super excited about partners like Bethesda coming in with Doom and Fallout so yeah. yeah I think for next I think the important thing to remember is um, so I'm also an academic and yeah. I actually started in VR in 2002 and was there for eight years and working in a cave research uh, kind of a like a space and it was right after the first kind of bubble of VR crash so sort of the way I look about VR is thinking about it as a stairway of development, right? And sort of a cycle where there's a growth and an explosion, and then there's a quieter moment where a lot of the progress right. goes forward, and then another, you have to be ready for the next sort of element or the spike in growth and explosion. And um, as a academic, I think I'd like to see um, headsets that are more like cheaper, consumer ready, more like available to a general population. Um, also figuring out what people, act, what content people want to see. Um, as an artist and developer, I'd really like to see our, our product for uh, Google for Daydream um, was a really great way to get into VR, but I'd like to see more support for longer quality, long form content for artists and developers. Gotcha. Matt? Uh, for me, it's, it's interesting because I think one of the biggest challenges right now is just general consumer confusion you have all different headsets providing a lot of different levels of experience at a lot of different price points. Everything from Google Cardboard advertising itself as like a 360 or VR experience right. for a buck to you know the mid-range where it's slot in your phone and kind of take it with you to the dedicated headsets like the Vive and Oculus where you know these are super powered machines that are delivering you really immersive 360 VR content. It's, it's incredible, right? Um, but to the average consumer who doesn't follow a lot of this, how do you differentiate these different price points? How do you differentiate these different experiences? And how do you know which one should, is the one that you should be jumping in on? Right. Uh, especially when a lot of these devices are expensive. So I think that's, that's the first step that I, I want to see is just more education in the space. And then secondly is, you know, what is that killer app? What is the thing that's gonna convince people that this is an experience that I need in yeah. my household for my entertainment? Um, you know, I was excited to see Bethesda, you know, announce, hey, here's Fallout 4, hey, here's Doom VR, because now all of a sudden you're seeing uh, developers start to publish, like, fully fleshed out, yeah. really immersive Very long worlds. games. Exactly, yeah, right. very long games that yeah. are going to convince you this is a world that you want to expose uh, yourself to and be immersed in, in this VR headset, and that's why you need to do it on, on a more premium headset like the Vive. Well, I think, you know, as we look at the market, like, what we're dealing with today is, innovators, early adopters, and there's a really healthy mix of uh, consumers out there that actually already have these high-end PC games, right? Uh -huh. And who we're targeting and how we're targeting them, like from the, the rich you know, gaming experiences to you know, what types of equipment they already have. I mean, there are millions of customers out there right. that don't need to upgrade their PC at all. The next set of customers only has to upgrade a GPU, you know, but then now thinking about that, like that's still early adopters, that's still innovators. Thinking about how then do you get to like that early mass consumer, and then that's where that price point really becomes right. something of concern. But it's also the solutions, right? It's it's also the experience. It's that setup experience. Mass consumers today or early majority, 
you know, they wouldn't really, they don't want to deal with USB or drivers or right. tethers. Like, they want wireless. They want simplicity. They want plug and play. So there's things that, from an industry perspective, we really actually have to solve as a product, um, in addition to the content uh, length and depth. But we also have to solve these other things to actually open up the market to that bigger audience to see those double digit you know, growth margins. Right. I think there's a general trend in terms of like what I've seen asks from developers, for developers to start thinking about untethered, um, portable experiences that can be easily shared uh -huh. um, and brought into everyone's living rooms. Um, and I think sort of for a more consumer space, maybe that's where, where things will be headed. Um, though I, I think there's a lot of like emphasis on that. And, and I want to say like in terms of the bifurcation, there's a little bit of schizophrenia in terms of like the buying power of the consumers right now. Yeah. Um, for example, when we show our work, we have to not only show our wor work, but educate the consumers why like our mobile um, project is different than something that would be on the Vive or right, why it right. can't just be transferred over. Sure. We've seen these technology shifts over, you know, with the rise of the internet and smartphones. What can we learn from those and apply to this new one that we see coming, you know, with VR? In terms of like standard, it's really hard to design and, and develop a standard when um, having kind of seen this field progress for many years, the market pressure of competition is sort of fierce and like yep. you are always having to as a developer kind of renegotiate and re-see what the vision is going right. to be. Um, so I don't know if it can like as easily settle on a standard when this term of VR and this idea is more like points on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. From like a 360 video and the medium, uh, the use of trying to create something for a 360 video is very different than the process of trying to create a fully fleshed right. out CG game, sure. right? So uh, it's hard to think of everything as falling under the word VR and like, you know, partially, what is that? I think, I think it would be really great for us to like continue that standards discussion. But there's also standards in the sense of like the software standards and actually being able to create open structure and platform. Like we're involved with yeah, Kronos, true. right? Yeah. Uh, Valve is involved with Kronos. Yeah. Oculus is involved with Kronos. Uh, Samsung and, and the likes. And we should keep doing those things right. and making it as easy as possible for developers to move their content yeah. across platform. The internet wouldn't become a thing without open standards right. and uh, a, cer a certain bit of neutrality there. So, yeah, is that what you kind of want to see? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For, for me, I think it really boils down to three things. And I think you addressed one of those key points, which is accessibility. Yeah. Like right now, there's a lot of wires, especially in like the, the most premium experiences. There's a lot of wires. It requires a lot of computing technology that people might not be familiar with, so it's good to hear that being addressed. Even the headset look and feel itself, starting to slim those down into something that is much more accessible or much more relatable to you know, an average consumer's day-to-day -day life is going to go leaps and bounds to you know, convincing people, this is a piece of technology that doesn't scare me anymore, right. but is something that I understand and can like adopt and, and really get behind. It's the same thing, again, to the idea of email. You know, oh, this is just like sending a letter, but more convenient and faster. You know, like, gotcha. there, there's that sort of thing. The, uh, the second part is, again, like, what is the killer app? What need does this fill in my in my everyday life? Or what is the, why, why is this a necessity to me? How is this going to deepen my entertainment experience or my day-to-day -day life? How is it going to increase my productivity? I think right now a lot of people still, you know, don't know what role VR fits into their life. Right. And I think that gets tied into kind of the third big hurdle that I think VR has to overcome is is getting in before AR really starts to make a surge into the market. And I think AR right now is one of those things that is much easier for people to understand because it exists in the world around them. It's, it, the applications are very immediate, right? I look at a wall, I'm able to create a billboard there, right. or put like a, an imaginary thing next to my phone, and it's like the application is easy, it makes sense, it's in the world around me, but I can also create these really incredible immersive AR experiences. You know, if, if AR is able to kind of achieve that adoption before VR is really kind of entering market, I think that's when it's going to really start to struggle to find its foothold. Um, but, you know, so hopefully VR is able to kind of like increase their timelines and, and really prove themselves before AR kind of like uh, accelerates into the marketplace. Gotcha.